Hey, it's Elaine. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm so thrilled to welcome our featured guest who will, who's here to share her personal experience of finding empowerment through trauma. Devin Trimbrell is a trauma-informed yoga instructor and energy healer. She holds a diploma in social service work and is an ambassador for the Ontario Social Service Worker Association. She has worked in frontline youth and adult crisis, mental health, addictions, trauma, suicide intervention, and a youth ministry funded criminal diversion program. Devin created Emerald Topaz Healing in 2017 after a near fatal car accident and now supports others one-on-one -on -one and in workshop setting to take control over their healing journey and find empowerment through trauma. Devin, it is so great to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's honestly so awesome to be here and to be able to sharing some tools and my journey. Um, I want to just touch base with everybody to begin with. Obviously, you know, our topic is trauma and um, we'll definitely be getting into some things that are potentially really triggering. So what I always like to do in settings like this is just to ask everybody to write down one name of somebody that's a safe space for you. If at the end of this that you need to kind of debrief with and go over some things, um, and you can reach out to, and then after that person, just uh, write down my name if that person isn't available to hold space for you. Just so you have the backup, just in case. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. Um, so I want to start by going back in time. I'd love it if you could walk us through some of the major life experiences that have really shaped you and your path of now serving and supporting others. Um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so it's a pretty long story. Um, so I'll try and keep it brief. I know we talked about that. Um, so I grew up, um, as I said, in Toronto. I grew up in a small sort of pocket of Toronto, uh, Toronto Mills, um, and then also spent a ton of time in Flemington Park. So my, I was honestly raised in an entire community and family and extended family of educators and helpers and volunteers and um, community workers and community justice activists. Um, my mom ran a Red Cross in Flemington Park and then an ESL school, and my dad was a politician. Uh, my godmother ran the Red Cross after her, so I really don't remember a time where I didn't volunteer. My grandparents volunteered their whole lives, my parents have, my siblings have, so it was very much raised to be socially aware and socially conscious. Um, and helping others was something that we did throughout the week, on weekends, it was just something that was part of our day-to-day -day life and I don't really know anything different. Um, for me though, um, I began to have a lot of struggles in and around seven and eight years old. Um, my dad had left politics, there was a lot of kind of chaos and upheaval in our home, and then I was abused by a babysitter. Um, and for me, experiencing sexual abuse, you don't know as a kid that that is wrong at the time. So very quickly, within about a year or two, can you not hear me? I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, within about a year or two, I started to experience symptoms of that trauma. Um, so it started with anxiety, not wanting to go to school, having a lot of just, um, you know, overt expressions of trauma. I, you know, was always sort of described as family and close friends as being like an overly sensitive kid. I was overly emotional. Um, and then really by the time I was 12, I had been abused by three other people. And all of them, which I think is really important to mention, were known to my family. Um, you know, these were people that my family trusted and would have never in a million years um, would have thought um, that this would have occurred to me. Um, so my parents, given the positions that they were in, my dad was Minister of Health until I was seven, um, utilized that platform to help to get me support. Um, but it was really support for my symptoms. So by the time I was 15, I was really, really struggling with managing the symptoms of my anxiety. And again, not really understanding where that was coming from and simply feeling that in my body in such an intense way, um, it was decided that I would be medicated. So at the time, the medication was really beneficial for me to manage my symptoms of anxiety. And it was coupled with, you know, going to counseling and doing CBT and biofeedback and a lot of different somatic type things. But again, nobody was asking me those questions of where it was coming from. But if you don't know as a child where that root is from, or if what occurred to you was even wrong, then you can't identify that as your, you know, onset issue that's happening. Um, 
so I was able, being medicated, I was able to mitigate those symptoms. I still really struggled with panic attacks and panic disorder and anxiety disorder. At the time, I um, was diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder. Um, I was able to work. I was able to, even though I went to alternative schools that were able to better support me in my sort of specific unique needs, I was able to graduate. Um, I moved away. Um, and being medicated never um, seemed like I had any other choice outside of that. That was just sort of, I was told that that would be sort of my life. Um, I ended up going into retail. I was a successful retail manager for a long time. I uh, moved to London and I became a retail manager. And then I had um, a workplace injury. I slipped and fell on the ice um, and wasn't able to continue in my job um, and needed some support from my employer. And unfortunately, my employer, like so many people, um, weren't willing to support me or accommodate me. So they uh, terminated me, which then, um, Actually, I should mention about a year prior to that happening, I had come off of medication with the support of my physician um, and some other holistic modalities um, and was doing quite well and was managing and sort of digging into where those traumas had come from and had started looking at those traumas and working through that healing process. Then when I was fired, um, it really brought on a lot of symptoms of depression. For a lot of people, that experience trauma, it can manifest, especially if it's suppressed and you're not given the emotional tools to be able to process it. It can manifest in chronic illness, chronic disease, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, things like that. So that was my experience. I developed um, a chronic pain condition because of it, as well as depression. Um, you know, oftentimes with um, income instability and housing instability, um, it adds all of those extra stressors. And for somebody that's experienced trauma, oftentimes it then sort of catapults into all of these different, different concerns. Um, I again sort of pulled my bolts, sort of bootstraps up and um, advocated for myself and uh, worked with Goodwill, which is an amazing organization, um, and got second career funding and I went back to school. Um, so I went back to school in 2013 and I moved up north of Barrie and um, started my sort of career change into social service work, still managing um, the depression and anxiety, but I was able to only have to be on medication for about six months and then came off of it um, again in sort of 2011 before I had gone back to school. And again, with the support of um, some really great pain psychologists and my family doctor at the time. Um, so I went back to school in 2013 and really sort of threw myself into um, learning how to help other people. And, you know, anyone that's gone through any type of social service training of any kind, whether it's counseling or addictions, it often mirrors for you a lot of your own issues. Um, and for me, at the end of my um, first semester, I found out I had uh, been pregnant um, and had miscarried. And for me, um, the trauma of that and trying to process that was too much. So I really just buried that down and, and carried on in my studies and really focused on that. Um, I went to the field. I worked for a couple great organizations in Barrie, um, Elizabeth Fry, where I worked um, with youth directly in a criminal diversion program, and then crisis support with the Canadian Mental Health Association. And for me, so much of my healing in that time was from helping others find healing in their own journeys. Um, in the spring of 2017, I had wrapped up two contracts and um, was really sort of taking the summer and um, deciding where I was going to go um, next and whether I was going to move and um, honestly was having a pretty good time um, and felt like I was doing really well. Even though there was so much of my trauma that I had still suppressed, there was a lot that I had worked through and I thought I was good. Um, the universe, as she is, decided otherwise. And um, in the middle of June of 2017, at one o'clock in the morning, driving on a rural highway, I struck a man that was walking in the middle of the road. Um, I nearly died, he nearly died. The other driver that struck me afterwards um, and his um, co-pilot all made it out. Um, but for me in that time, um, it was really isolating. I didn't have a car, I totaled it. I um, wasn't able to leave my house. I sustained multiple concussions in the matter of seconds. Um, it aggravated my already existent, though I was managing it, chronic pain condition and exacerbated it beyond any pain I had ever experienced. 
and I was completely isolated. I lived alone. I had some uh, close friends. My sister was about 45 minutes away, but otherwise I was stuck in my house. And because of my concussion and the PTSD from that accident and the magnification of my previous traumas, um, I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't use social media. I couldn't even listen to music. Um, I was essentially isolated in a room. And so often for people that have experienced complex or repeated multiple traumas in their life, there becomes a time that there's a breaking point and you, um, you know, develop coping mechanisms to carry on in life and have jobs and relationships and all those things. And then something happens that um, sort of brings you to your knees. And for me, this, this was it. Um, I then became really, really suicidal and I couldn't avoid all of the traumas I had suppressed, the baby that I had lost and um, sort of the pain of the years that had accumulated and then the loss of the life that I had just created and retraining and all of those things. So um, for me in that time, I shut myself away from a lot of people. Um, thank God for a lot of the friends and you know, um, few family members that I had that were able to hold space for me, which is really challenging for, um, you know, when people are in um, a dark night of the soul or in a time that is so emotionally volatile, it's really challenging for the people close to you to see you go through that and to hold space for that. Um, so with the support of um, some good friends and, um, you know, some family members, I created Emerald Topaz Healing. And that was essentially out of um, the medication the doctors had given me, I was reacting really poorly to. They were making me more suicidal, which can sometimes be the case with antidepressants and things they use for suicidal ideation. And I turned to holistic modalities again. I went back to um, you know, First Nations healing, which I had learned when I was in school, and I turned to meditation and yoga and all of those things. So in December of 2017 is when I created uh, Emerald Topaz Healing, and I started um, doing some more sort of workshops and making smudge kits, because that's really how I dealt um, with the PTSD um, and sort of able to, the insurance company wasn't supportive of helping me to get back to driving. And um, in order to drive, you can't be sedated. Um, so I had to find some holistic modalities to help me do that. So I turned to energy healing. I turned to some First Nations healing um, and then really just had to dig into my traumas and start feeling through everything, which is a really, really messy endeavor. And um, oftentimes we think of um, these breakthroughs in our healing as being these beautiful, glorious, white light, peaceful things. And the reality and the harsh truth of it is they're not. Um, it's usually really dark and messy and, you know, ugly crying and days of not showering or eating and um, to get through to the other side of it. So that's really sort of become my mission is, um, talking people through that and normalizing the experience of a healing journey um, and demystifying, um, you know, the white light prettiness um, that we're so often told to expect. Because for a lot of people, they hold a lot of shame and guilt, not just about their experiences, but then their experience of their healing as well, that it doesn't look the way they think it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I want to thank you so much for sharing that. I love all the, the detail that you described because I feel that traumatic experiences can be so unbearable and intolerable at times. And I think so many of us are vulnerable or susceptible to really pushing them out and acting like nothing happened. So I'm so happy that you brought up that point about like the, you know, the chronic pain that you were experiencing and, um, you know, other other things you know, it all just sort of came together. And I just, I love that you really emphasize that um, because traumatic experiences in our earlier years can um, really make it difficult for us to establish safe and trusting relationships as an adult. And I think it takes tremendous energy to keep functioning while carrying the memories of the past, you know, the shame, the weakness, the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, long after a, a traumatic experience is over, it can be reactivated in like the slightest hint of danger. Um, I would love it if you could now talk to us a little bit about triggers and how they can really rob our capacity for joy and even relational intimacy, um, but also how we can make a, a conscious effort to claim ownership over these triggers. Uh, talk to us a little bit, a little bit about this. For sure. Um, you know, what's really interesting is experiencing um, 
childhood abuse, whether that's sexual or physical or mental abuse, um, it really creates a discord in terms of healthy boundaries, in terms of healthy communication, in terms of emotional regulation. Um, a lot of those things were very foreign to me. Um, and not that I didn't have people in my life that tried to teach them to me, but what I felt in my body and when I would be triggered as a child, I wasn't able to articulate what that felt like in my body, what it was bringing up for me. And so again, oftentimes I was um, sort of described as a really emotional kid. And I think, you know, in those triggered times when I got to an adult and I was, um, you know, in romantic relationships and having close friendships with people, it was really challenging when those triggers would come up. Oftentimes um, as a child, as well as an adult, when you are triggered, um, you can act out in seemingly un, um, sort of, it's unimaginable to other people why that is your reaction to what seems, um, you know, like not a big deal to other people. Um, I remember sobbing for a couple days over a dish that was broken that was my grandmother's. And that wasn't obviously the thing that I was upset about, but in that moment, that's what I was tied to. So I think, you know, for me, trying to navigate romantic relationships was really, really difficult, you know, so often for people that experience trauma, especially early childhood, and what that does to your emotional reasoning and how your brain um, sort of sees fear and triggers is, um, you know, you don't know how to navigate those conversations. And oftentimes you will attract partners that can be codependent and really play into anxious attachment styles that is so often to develop or avoidant attachment styles. And it's, you know, people don't oftentimes don't know that you don't have to subscribe to one or the other. Um, there were times that I was very anxious with my partners and friendships in terms of my attachment styles. And then there were times I was very avoidant and I would shut them down when they were triggered and would punish them. So that kind of plays into, you know, that idea that I uh, spoke about, about it being very hard for other people. If you are not aware of your triggers, if you are not aware of how those triggers can play out in your friendships, uh, familial relationships or romantic relationships, it's hard to expect that another person is able to decipher those for you. Um, and so it gets really, really messy. And then oftentimes you're triggering someone else and then they're triggering you and it becomes this volcano, which was honestly, often the times in my um, longest committed relationship is it was that um, escalation back and forth until it was, you know, too much to be able to work through. Yeah, I, honestly, I think that, that that is so key for understanding, um, you know, because what I find with triggers that I think the most complicated thing about it is that when we are triggered, it's, and we're not conscious of it, it's, it's almost impossible to know what's truth and what's imagination. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because you I, feel that so deeply, right? In your body and it's, it's palpable. And the fear that comes up or the anger that comes up and you know, really reminding yourself that anger is a second emotion. I was angry for a lot of years and would lash out in anger in a lot of ways, but I was so deeply, deeply hurt. And I couldn't feel that hurt and understand where that hurt was coming from and allow myself to process it. So I was angry. And that is what would come out. And for me now, um, you know, people will say, you know, I avoid my triggers, you know, if a certain person or a certain thing, and for years I was that, I was agoraphobic um, for a period of time and avoided everything um, because it was so raw, which is completely normal and completely valid and very much a part of my healing journey. And I needed that at that time. Um, but now I lean into them. Um, am I always great at it? I'm very much no one's guru and, you know, I'm still on my healing journey and I still make mistakes and I still learn. But when I'm triggered by someone else, when I am triggered by something else, if something elicits a response for me, I ask why. And for me, um, you know, being my own expert in my own body, so often we give that power over to a doctor or a holistic healer and want that quick fix and want them to tell us a way that we're going to fix ourselves. And it is really true through those triggers that they are the gateway to your healing. They are the messengers to tell you where those insights are, where that pain is really coming from and what you need to look at. So now I lean in. Um, unfortunately, a lot of my really good friends, some of them are on the call today, 
um, have had to have some pretty at length conversations to help me navigate through that and really understand. And that's so important to have those people to help you to navigate to that place, to the, to the point of origin where that trigger is really coming from. And then honestly, you get to a point where you become desensitized to them. Um, and it's through that desensitization process that you get to take your healing back and you get to feel empowered. Um, I was often um, really, really terrified because of the accident, uh, because of transports. I moved to a place where transports go by constantly. I didn't know when I bought the place, it was kind of serendipitous, but now it doesn't bother me. I was able to desensitize myself to it because I saw the link to where that came from and mm -hmm. was able to work through it. Yeah, I love that. Uh, that's that's s such key, leaning in, you know, that desensitization when we lean into them and understand that, okay, you know, this is where it is. This is the point where I lose that emotional you know, regularity, or I lose that, um, that ability to control my emotions. I think that that sure. can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I really believe that the key to healing these triggers is to first understanding our emotions, uh, the complexity of the mind, um, but sure. also working with our bodies where a lot of the subconscious patterning is stored. Talk to us about the energetic holding of unreleased traumas and even the energetic chakras within the body. Okay, um, so I'll kind of break it up into two. I love that you touched on the mind piece as well because there is a neural programming to trauma, to fear, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, you know, we do have neural plasticity. That is really important. You know, we often um, hear people say, you know, a leopard never changes the spots. I would not work in addictions and do the work that I do if I didn't believe in the fundamental ability for people to change their mindsets and to change their life. Um, so, you know, that's one piece of it is looking at your mindset, looking at your attachment styles, um, looking at your communication styles and working that way. In terms of energy being held in the body, you know, with the understanding that energy is never broken, right? It either um, changes forms or it's able to be released within your body. And when we are unable or don't have the tools to process um, traumatic events that happen to us um, or have a safe space to be able to work through that, your body holds it. Um, and oftentimes we can see this and tons of different modalities talk about it. We obviously don't have enough time to get super deep into it, but please do research in terms of traditional Chinese medicine and chiropractic and osteopathy uh, massage therapy. Um, there's so much research now coming out on all of this stuff. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, but it's often held in your tissue and it's often held within your myofascial tissues within your body. Um, so we'll see that in chronic stress, chronic illness, chronic disease in the body. Again, you know, the chronic pain, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia. And when you're triggered, you'll notice like today being scared to do this interview, my back just lit up. I didn't do anything. I didn't lift anything heavy. It just really um, lit up. And I know that that's what that's from. But um, I actually made notes on the chakra because I didn't want to miss anything. So um, for those of you that don't know, your chakras are the energy points in your body. And what is absolutely beautiful is that the yogic chakras actually align to the meridians used in traditional Chinese medicine. They align to the meridians used by chiropractors. They align to the meridians used by osteopathy and massage therapy. So many different holistic modalities. If you lay all of their body maps, they all align. Um, so it's seen in lots of different areas. Um, so your root chakra essentially is um, right at the base of your spine, at your perineum. And it is the seat of your survival, the foundations of your life. So this is commonly a problem um, for people of early childhood or sexual abuse at any time in your life. Um, it is generally blocked by fear. That is usually the, um, the emotion that comes up with that. And generally, um, you'll notice that you'll have low back pain with that male or female that'll come up with that, um, as well as some bladder stuff. For a lot of people, bladder lights up with a lot of different chakras. Um, your sacral chakra is your pleasure center. Again, another one that is highlighted with sexual abuse as well. Um, the blocking emotion generally for the sacral chakra is guilt. Um, and then with that, it's generally, um, your hips that are affected. I love that I'm showing you and you can see, um, your hips are, um, affected by that as well as bladder, menstrual cycle, and prostate can be affected for men as well in that area. 
Your solar plexus um, is taught by me by a First Nations elder is the seat of your inner child. So your willpower, um, how you stand up for yourself, and it's generally blocked by shame. Um, with this is generally issues with your kidneys as well as digestion. <clears throat> so for a lot of people um, in terms of um, feeling that in their body and anxiety, you'll often get that indigestion or upset stomach. That's generally a blockage in your inner child's uh, solar plexus area. Your heart chakra, um, really in the center of your chest, um, has everything to do with love. How you give love to others in the world around you, but also how you accept it and how the boundaries you set around it. This is generally blocked by grief and sadness. Um, this one, obviously, you know, heart disease is a huge one. Um, in terms of anxiety, um, for me, experiences of anxiety and PTSD, I'd often feel uh, heart palpitations so much that they, you know, did tons of tests and there was nothing wrong with my heart. My heart chakra was just blocked and then um, I needed to release what I was holding there in terms of that grief and sadness of the loss that I had experienced. Um, your throat chakra is all about your truth, but not just the truth that you express outwardly and using your voice, but the truth that you seek out in the world as well. It is blocked by lies. Um, in terms of ailments, uh, thyroid conditions are often linked to uh, throat chakra blockages. And then um, experiences of panic attacks when you feel like your throat is closing. Oftentimes you'll see people holding their throat when they're panicking. That's a throat chakra blockage. Uh, third eye is uh, the seat of your insight and intuition and is often blocked by delusions. So perhaps the delusions that you carry in your life to help suppress those emotions. Um, experiences that you may have are vertigo, headache, blurred vision. Again, all of these are things that are commonly experienced uh, during panic attacks. Um, and then your crown chakra is literally the top of your head. Um, and it is your connection to a cosmic or divine energy or a higher power. And it is often blocked by your ego attachment. Excuse me. So again, those um, blockages you put in place, your persona in the world, the masks that you wear are often attributed to that. Um, and the number one thing for that is headaches. Um, when I was a little girl and I would have panic attacks, I would describe it felt like a giant was ripping my head open. That's how I described it at 10 years old. And that is often the case with a crown chakra blockage. With these energetic points in mind and with, you know, the idea of the body holding um, some of this unreleased trauma, can you share with our listeners today some self-regulation and healing tools for managing symptoms of trauma? Um, you can share, I don't know if you, if you want to share for all the chakras or for some of them, that would be awesome. Yeah, um, honestly, um, doing chakra specific, um, there's tons of crystals that I use for different um, releasing within the chakra. Um, there's yoga specific to each chakra that will help you um, release as well. Um, I think really in terms of finding empowerment in your healing and um, releasing energy within your body as a, as a whole, your chakras as a whole, or, you know, specific chakras is really becoming very curious about your body and what you're feeling. Because as much as your triggers are messengers, your body is a messenger and your body will tell you where it needs to release. And for me, really, I, um, you know, really became very curious and would refer to myself as my most fascinating case study, because the more I dug in, the more messages my body would give me. And the more I was able to listen to those messages and continue to make progress and sort of elevate not just my consciousness within my body, but outwardly as well in my ability to help others heal. Um, so I have a pretty long list of self-regulation and healing tools. And I think it's really important to know that everybody's um, tool belt looks different and what works for one person isn't going to work for you. Um, you know, and the more options you have in your tool belt, the more you're able to rely on those. Um, I think that, you know, it's really important that we don't compare our healing journey to other people as long, you know, as well as not comparing, um, you know, your traumas to other people. We didn't get to this place in the same way and how you heal isn't going to happen in the same way as it happens for someone else either. Um, you know, so some self-regulation and healing tools, uh, meditation and breath work is really, really big. 
Um, deep belly breathing, you know, really helps to release the diaphragm, which um, is a huge connection to your vagus nerve, which will help with overall relaxation. Um, again, I spoke of yoga and chakra specific work. Um, there's a beautiful um, Hawaiian forgiveness prayer called Ho'oponopono, which is I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. You can do those specific to each chakra. You can do it outwardly to people that have caused you uh, stress or harm or trauma in your life. Um, for me, uh, something that has been beautiful and very healing is the burning of herbs and resins, which can be found again all over the world on every continent by many indigenous groups as well as uh, faith-based. So it's the burning of herbs and resins to cleanse energy. For me, for trauma, um, really Palo Santo is um, my go-to as well as frankincense resin. And then really finding um, trauma-informed uh, energy healers, um, whether that's a naturopath, whether that's um, a holistic energy healer like a Reiki worker, much as myself, um, an energetic um, or trauma-informed chiropractor. I have a great chiropractor here in town who did trauma-specific training on trauma-specific releases, as well as osteopathy. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine is another huge one. Um, you know, they talk a lot about the different energy points in the body and emotions that are stored and tied to each uh, specific organ and chakra point. Uh, cupping and acupuncture as well. And then really becoming acquainted with your triggers. Um, again, we spoke of that a little bit, but looking at them as allies rather than your enemy and as messengers. Um, and then identifying safe people to hold space for you um, and understanding that not everyone in your life is gonna be able to come on this healing journey with you. Not everybody is going to be able to um, hold space for you when you need and learning how to offer that understanding. Perhaps they've been traumatized in their life and they can't uh, hold space for you. Maybe they've just had a hard day and they don't have the energy to hold space for you. Um, and, and maybe it's just they don't have the tools to be able to give you what you need in that moment. And that's okay. Um, and honestly, learn. That is, become curious about all of the information that's out there. You know, now again is a time where there's lots of podcasts available. There's lots of, um, you know, Instagram. I follow Laura Hesp. She does some amazing things. Um, a friend of mine uh, runs with deer. She does um, different uh, tinctures and things like that. That's been really supportive for me now that I'm not medicated. Um, Mastic Kip also is another one I follow. And then there's loads of books. Um, so for me, the Empath Survival Guide was a huge one. The Body Keeps Score was another huge one for me. Uh, when the Body Says No by Gabor Mate um, was huge. Uh, I'm reading now Claim Your Power by Mastin Kip, which um, is beautifully done. Um, Codependent No More, which looks at obviously codependency that's caused by trauma. Attached, um, loving someone with PTSD, which honestly is really more for somebody um, in a relationship and them supporting you. But I found it really beneficial for myself. Um, so yeah, there, there's tons and tons and tons, tons of stuff. Devin, thank you yeah. so much for sharing your personal experience, all the, those great tools and yeah, absolutely. You know, ways of, of managing traumas. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the chat today. It was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I'll talk to you Devin. soon. So I do see that we have a, a question here from Michelle. Um, she says, um, oh, let me just pull this up here. How does one specifically use the crystals? Uh, I'm open to learning how does, uh, how does one be curious? Um, so basically, how does one use crystals for healing? Yeah, um, so really for me, I started just going to crystal shops and picking up ones and seeing how they made me feel, um, which is a really kind of cool experiment. Um, but as I dove sort of deeper into it, there's loads of books. Um, there's a crystal Bible and honestly, Google. Um, you can, if you know, if you are tapping into your body and doing breath work and you are able to feel in your body where it's heightened, so you're looking at your heart chakra, um, you can Google heart chakra crystals, um, you know, to get, give you a bit of a head start. Malachite is a great one, um, to get started with heart chakra. Uh, rose quartz is another one that's great for heart chakra as well. Um, also, um, 
a good friend of mine, Desiree Dawn Designs. She uh, does all sorts of different education on crystal healing um, for, for anything, for all different ailments. Um, but in terms of trauma and anxiety specific, um, ones that I use, um, and for anyone that really feels like a highly sensitive person or identifies as an empath, um, I use hematite, which is really, really grounding. Honestly, anyone that knows me knows that I carry a ton of my bra all the time. It's just really grounding. Um, uh, tourmaline is another one that's really, really good. It absorbs negative energy. The importance with crystals, though, is knowing that you need to cleanse them. They will help absorb energies from you um, and will help absorb other people's energies so they're not coming into your aura and energy field, but you need to cleanse them. So cleansing them in sunlight, um, cleansing them under the moon, um, cleansing them with your energy, you can do that as well. Um, but really, if you're getting crystals, it's really important that you follow up and make sure that you're knowing how to cleanse them specific. Some aren't, you can't cleanse them in water and some can, look them up. Awesome, thank you. Uh, another question from Michelle is, uh, I'm wondering how to differentiate, differentiate what is the right resources to look more into um, to your, I guess, to your own healing, healing journey? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that's actually a really, really good question. Um, as I mentioned before, I often looked at healers, much like I had looked at medical professionals as being the expert of me. And I would go to them and I'd be like, okay, cool. A friend told me to come to you and I came to you and you're going to fix me. You need to get to a place where you trust your gut. It's like, you know, often when we talk to people in mental health and addictions and they're looking at getting a counselor, we tell them, don't expect to stick with your first counselor because it's not always gonna be a good fit. And you need to find someone to help you on your healing journey and be on your healing team. I don't just see one people, one person. I don't just have one coach. I don't have one mentor, um, but I had to feel through that. And I had to know that it was okay to walk away from a therapist or a chiropractor or a social worker or an energy healer when they weren't a good fit for me. Not everyone is going to be a good fit for you. So it's trusting your intuition. If you don't feel safe and comfortable with that person, and I'm not saying go and see them once and then walk away. Um, you know, sometimes it will take some time to build a rapport with someone, whether that's mental health counseling or energy counseling, counseling work, energy work. Um, but trust your gut. You will know, your body will tell you. If you are really, really anxious every time you go and see that person and you don't feel alleviated of that anxiety or feel that you're gaining tools when you're leaving, they are not the person for you. And that is 1000% okay. Um, I stuck with a lot of people that I shouldn't have for longer than I shouldn't have. And it starts to make you uh, regress in your healing and not go forward. So trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Another question from Jamie is, my partner struggles with extreme anxiety and panic attacks. He lost his mother from cancer when he was a young man. What practices might I tell him or support him with? He always has heart palpitations. Yeah, that uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm so very sorry for his loss. Um, and the heart palpitations, obviously, as we talked about, are grief and sadness. Um, and for men, it's, it's it's a whole kettle of fish, it's different. Um, men in terms of expressing emotions, grief and sadness is so very challenging. As much as, um, you know, I was born in the 80s, um, you know, we weren't given a lot of the, the emotional tools to process how we feel. Men are still battling the stigmas of being a strong man. So getting to a place of processing that grief and sadness. Um, I would um, suggest that he connect with um, an energy healer to help him work through that. Um, the process for him is going to be very uncomfortable. Um, and you need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It sucks. And it feels awful to release emotion that has been trapped in your body for decades. It's awful. It, like, I will not lie to you. It is um, soul wrenching. But the other side of that is much lighter and freer and um, you are able to navigate the world so much better and you won't have that anxiety plaguing you. So um, he needs to do some work around um, releasing from his heart chakra. So um, doing some sound vibrational healing, you can look up solfeggio frequencies and meditating to those will help to shift. Um, carrying a rose quartz crystal with him and 
cleansing it every single night. Um, and then perhaps looking into some grief support. There is some great, I don't know where you are, um, but if you want to reach out, I'm happy to provide some resources. Um, but there is some great um, grief support. And there is now becoming um, more avenues for men supported um, emotional support as well. Um, but he has to be open to it. That is something I should mention to you as well. Uh, you can't force anyone to heal that they are not ready to heal. You may have identified for him um, this is a, a core issue and something he needs to work on. But if he isn't there yet, no pushing, no amount of dropping hints is going to get him to get there. He has to be ready in his ego and his inner child to begin the work to heal that. Oftentimes we get very comfortable in our discomfort because it's the devil we know. Heather says, I am on disability right now and so don't have funds for resources outside of what's covered for ODSP. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for accessing things outside of the medical model? Ah, okay. So I have been so, so, so very lucky that um, I was on WSIB and was cut off and had no money. Uh, my best friend can tell you that they were shocked I paid, was able to pay any rent. Um, so oftentimes when you want to work with healers, these are people whose life purpose is to help people who are vulnerable. So I would um, strongly encourage you to be vulnerable. Send messages to people and say, this is what I'm able to um, pay, or this is my situation and I'm not able to pay. Is there a way that you can help me? And maybe they can't see you and provide full sessions, but they can provide you with resources. And again, for me, some of my greatest healing in times that I had absolutely no money were going out in nature, was getting into water, was um, going for walks, meditating. And some of that was the most empowering thing because money um, can sort of come with a, its own control, right? And you can get very lost in that. I spent, when I did have money, thousands of dollars on lots of different healers that in the long run weren't the best fit for me. And I needed to do more work on my own. So I would say, don't, Heather, don't discredit the work that you can do without money. And the inner healer and the self-healer that is innate to who you are in your being already without a penny in your pocket. Um, but again, with that being said, I would reach out to people and uh, be vulnerable and uh, ask for help because uh, I've received so, so, so much help and I wouldn't be where I am without the help I've received from people when I was in need. And I wouldn't have gotten it if I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Amy who says, the journey identifying triggers is like peeling an onion at times during a repeat or new traumatic event. For How sure. do we, or where do I start when it seems there are triggers everywhere and nowhere? Uh, my body is telling me a chronic, uh, a chronic pain condition flaring uh, at 10 since a recent traumatic event. Okay. Um, totally resonates, totally normal if you have multiple experiences of trauma and it is very much like an onion. Um, and that, you know, that's what happened to me with the accident. Um, and it's really trying to peel through them, understanding and offering yourself kindness. Um, the whole Pono Pono prayer I would give to myself, identify with myself and offer myself compassion that I wasn't able to process at all. And you can't, and, and, and don't try to, because you will exhaust yourself and the pain will become greater. So in those times of complete overwhelm, I do things like smudging, um, going out into nature. Um, a huge thing for me um, with the chronic pain is you need to drink an insane amount of water, like drink as much water as you thought you could possibly ingest, and then double that. Um, chronic pain and moving energy Anytime I do an energy session with a client, I tell them to drink two liters of water in the next 24 hours. It helps to flush that through your body. Um, in terms of the chronic pain as well, oftentimes it's vitamin and mineral deficiency. Speak to a doctor or a naturopathic doctor about that or your chiropractor. Um, that has been huge for me, but you need to really work on those grounding techniques. Um, limiting, for me personally, uh, limiting gluten, dairy, and sugar. White refined sugar has played a huge role in me managing my chronic pain. I don't take any medication for that. Um, it's really bad flare-ups that force me to, and I drink a ton of water. Um, and then all of those different grounding techniques. So um, where your pain is in your body, um, doing yoga specific to that, 
and then breathing in white light into that area and then exhaling any negativity or anything that no longer serves your highest and best good that's plaguing your body. That's a really brief answer. I'm so sorry. Please reach out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing those grounding techniques because um, that was actually a question that Jamie just asked. So I feel like you kind of just tackled two with one. Mm, cool. Uh, our last question is by Shalini who says, uh, if there is too much of body dissociation because uh, one isn't able to exactly point out or feel the trauma in the body, what do we do to get back to the body, especially to explore those triggers stored within the body? That's honestly an amazing question. Um, thank you so much for asking. Shalini, is that, am I pronouncing it right? Shalini. Yes. Shalini. Um, so dissociation um, is, is huge. And dissociation is a way that our bodies um, try to protect us, essentially, when um, the feeling in your body is too much to manage. Um, again, a lot of the same answers um, that I went over in the previous question just before this one. So those grounding techniques. So um, for a lot of people that have experienced trauma, you're not able to close your eyes. So when you meditate, you can just lower your gaze. Um, and that is almost like a gradual invitation into your body to begin to um, sort of sit in it. Um, really look at Gabor Mate's information about uh, when the body says no and the body keeps score. Both of those would be really, really helpful for you. The library has those. Um, but the breath work exercises, um, that is how I found out at 12 years old that I had anxiety or was diagnosed with it is I was told I was holding my breath all the time. And that is so common. And when you hold your breath, your um, spirit, in a sense, your consciousness within your body almost suffocates. And that's when you feel that dissociation period. So all of those grounding techniques, I think, would be really beneficial. And um, some gentle sort of light flow, really low to the ground, grounded yoga. Um, would be a really good place to start. Um, and then honestly, if you are really struggling with the dissociation and it becomes quite fearful for you, which um, I can attest can, can happen, um, reaching out to a crisis line um, or finding um, an energy worker slash counselor that is able to support you through that and what's coming up for you. And journaling, um, writing out obviously what is coming out because it sometimes makes sense in a clearer time than it did during those dissociated times and it gives you something to connect to. Devin, thank you so much for sharing such amazing, valuable information and resources. Thank you so much for joining us on the chat today. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it was just, um, I really feel like I heal so much through helping others heal. So, um, you know, thank you so much for including me in your platform and um, for all the workshops that you guys are doing every week. I've really been learning and growing and healing so much through all you guys are doing. So. Thank you guys.